Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to the Wednesday, May 20th, uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. Um, I have called to order the meeting here at 631. Uh, the next item is roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Um, Ms. Stevens, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, and at this time, I'm going to uh, unmute all members and alternates. Please make sure that you are unmuted on your end and um, that you have a little green microphone indicating that you can speak. And if everyone can their please. Okay, here we go. Eva Henry. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. William Lindstedt. Here. Randy Wheelock. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Engels. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. Mike Kaufman. Here. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margo Ramson. Here. Adam Cushing. Present. Roger Hudson. Here. George Teal. Tammy Maurer. Mike Sutherland. Jeremy Fay. Randy Wheel. Richard Champion. Nicole Frank. Present. Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, here. Steve Conklin, Linda Olson, here. Bill Gipp, Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Rachel Binkley. Present. Jim Dale. Here. George Lance. Dave Kerber. Mike Hillman. Stephanie Walton. Tim Barnes, Jacob LeBure, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Pamela Grove, Larry Strock, Present, Wynn Shaw, Here, Joan Peck, Here, Ashley Stolzman, Here, Connie Sullivan, Barney Drystadt, Joyce Palzuski, Colleen Whitlow. I'm here, present. Thank you. Paul Sutton, Sean Paré, Chris Larson, Julie Duran Melica, Joyce Downing. Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Sandy Hammerly, here, Jessica Sandgren, here, Herb Atchison, here, Bud Starker, Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, here. and Bill, oh, there you go, Bill Van Meter, here. All right. Thank you. And with this, that, Mr. Chair, we do have a form. Did you get me? I may have been muted. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yes. Thank you, bud. So uh, this is Matt Jones, uh, subbing for Elise Jones tonight for Boulder County Commissioner. And this is Eva Henry, Adams County Commissioner. I'm here. Karina Albert from Littleton as well. 
Thank you so much. Tammy Anyone Mauer else? for Centennial. Okay. Hi, uh, this is All Randy right. Wheel. I think I may have failed to unmute. Uh, That's okay. Thank you, Randy. Village. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that. I, I appreciate it. Um, the next item is uh, approval of the agenda. I would I would need a motion to approve the agenda, please. Ms. Stevens, do we have a hand? Uh, we do. It looks like we have one from uh, Herb Atchison. Herb, go ahead. Recommend approval of the agenda. Second. All right. Uh, we have approval and a second. All right, here we go, people. All in favor, say aye. 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 Against. Abstain. Motion carries. The we have an agenda. Thank you. Uh, next item, report of the chair. Um, I have nothing at this time, but I would yield the floor to uh, the report on performance and engagement. Uh, I believe that is Director Flynn. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, the performance and engagement committee did not meet this month, so there is no report. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, the next item is a report on finance and budget committee. Uh, Director Conklin. Okay, Director Conklin, you should be able to speak. Sorry about that. Ms. Stevens, are, are we, uh, uh, do we have issues with Director Conklin and his connection? Uh, it seems like we might be at this time. Um, um, I leave it to you on how you like to proceed. Yeah. Uh, Executive Director Rex, uh, you have the agenda that you can um, go over in, in absentia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if you would, uh, Director, uh, Executive Director Rex, uh, please, um, please do your report of the Executive Director at the same time. Mr. Chairman, I missed the first part of that. Did you want me to do something well, other than the report? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we're having some difficulties with Director Conklin's report out of um, Finance and Budget Committee. So if if you can speak to that, or if sure. um, if there's somebody else um, uh, staff wise that can speak to it, please uh, please feel free to. No, happy to do it, sir. Um, so Finance and Budget Committee this evening um, approved four action items, uh, three of which were are related to COVID. Um, the first was a resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into a contract with uh, Transit Plus, which is providing um, uh, consulting services for a ride alliance uh, program. The uh, second item was a resolution authorizing the executive director to approve um, a funding distribution plan and execute contracts to receive uh, um, COVID-19, the federal emergency monies uh, in a uh, of approximately $6.7 million. And I'll talk about a little bit of that in my executive director's report. Um, we had a, another resolution authorizing the executive director to extend current AAA provider contracts for two months and allocate additional federal funding in the amount of approximately 1.8 million to continue services through August 31st. And last but not least, we had a resolution authorizing the executive director to accept federal funds of up to 220,000 um, to support the COVID-19 pandemic response to ADRC for a period from May 1st, 2020 through April 31st, 2021. And then we had a, a update, an informational update from um, uh, Ashley Summers on our staff discussing the status of regional data acquisition projects. Um, Dr. Cox facilitates on behalf of the local governments and our partners. That's what was talked about at the Finance and Budget Committee. And as far as my executive director report, um, first of all, good evening, everybody. I hope you and your families are safe and healthy. I also wanted to give you a quick uh, COVID-19 update. Um, 
like many of you, we've extended we've extended our mandatory teleworking arrangement until May 31st um, with possible extensions. We are watching closely any changes to the governor's safer at home order and the city county of Denver's actions uh, to help us determine the timeline for reopening. Of course, we reside, the office resides in the city and county of Denver. Um, we, are, we are working on a, on a workplace transition plan for when we open the office back up. And we feel pretty comfortable that we can control the environment once we get staff into our, into our facility. Um, it's where we're really struggling is getting folks to the office. Uh, you know, vast majority of our folks take public transportation and just, just some of the concerns about taking public transportation right now, um, you know, we're just trying to figure out exactly how, how we're gonna proceed with that. So, um, so stay tuned on that. Um, also, AAA staff continues to be on the front lines as it comes to the COVID-19 COVID and the environment, as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's very fluid. Um, during Jayla's presentation last, at, at last month's board meeting, she mentioned, and, in, and of course we mentioned in the finance and budget report, that we are receiving approximately uh, $6.7 million in uh, COVID, federal COVID emergency funds uh, through the Family First Act, as well as the CARES Act. Um, and since that time, since we last met, uh, we've, we've met with many, many stakeholders, including county human services staff, our providers, of course, Dr. Cog's Advisory Committee on Aging, um, and, our, and the funding subcommittee to, that, to the ACA to discuss strategies to get this money out into the communities. Um, but before we do, however, we're really kind of waiting to see, get a, bet, a better picture of next year's state budget and if it affects funding for older adults, we know it will, to what extent we're still, we're still trying to figure out. Um, so in the event, we have to fill some, some funding holes associated with, so we're, we're, uh, we're carefully watching that and we should have better, better answers over the next couple of weeks. Jayla also mentioned last month in her, in her presentation that uh, we received word from our largest senior transportation provider, Senior Resource, Seniors Resource Center, um, that they will be ceasing trans transportation services on July 1st. Um, we have been aggressively pursuing solutions with many of our regional stakeholders, including CDOT, RTD, uh, via mobility services um, to one, pick up the essential, those critical trips that SRC is, is uh, currently providing their, um, uh, their clients during the pandemic. And those critical trips, I'm speaking more of like, um, uh, dialysis trips or chemo trips, those real critical trips, and they average about 80 to 100 uh, per day. And second, um, we're beginning a larger conversation about what senior transportation uh, will look like in this region in the long term. We're excited about that opportunity, um, and uh, we're trying to be as innovative as possible in, in, uh, in that ultimate solution. So please stay tuned. We should have more information next month on that. Um, but I would like to publicly thank SRC for all for all the help that they provided in this transitional period. Um, I know they they want to make sure that there are no seniors that are left behind in this initiative, and um, so I want to thank them uh, very much for that. And of course, SRC isn't going away; it's just getting out of the tran out of the transportation services business. I know they'd want me to say that. Um, also related to the COVID. Um, pandemic. On, on, April, on April 22nd, uh, Dr. Cog hosted a video conference of our city county managers uh, to provide them an opportunity to hear from how other communities, counties are responding to COVID-19. And towards the end of that meeting, uh, there was a suggestion made for Dr. Cog to explore creating a platform that all managers could use to continue those sorts of discussions. Um, things like obviously reopening, or maybe it's something to do with what, the, what communities' plans are for summer activities, et cetera, stuff like that. So staff developed a uh, Microsoft Teams-based platform, which we are calling the Manager's Huddle. Um, it's been up and running now for a couple of weeks, and uh, we're excited about it, and we, we hope that it will really provide value as we transition into the recovery phase of COVID. It's a, it's a platform exclusively for city and county managers, as well as um, you know, specified staff from those counties that don't have um, county managers. So just kind of FYI. Um, small area forecasts. Uh, during the month of May, Dr. Cog's regional planning and development team um, invited local planning staff from around the region to provide feedback on household and employment growth assumptions that will inform two very important products, the Dr. Cog 2050 Regional Transportation Plan 
and RTD system optimization plan, which is um, which will be a product of their reimagined RTD exercise. Um, so, uh, you know, we've already heard from many of our member communities, but I wanted to let the board of directors know there's still time to connect your team to the process. Um, we will be accepting feedback through um, through May 29th. So please get the word out to your communities. Um, and if you have any questions at all, uh, please reach out to, uh, to Brad Calvert, our Regional Planning and Development Director. Um, I would like to just draw your attention to the 2019 Public Engagement Report, which is included in the Information Items section of your agenda packet. It's item 14, Tashman K. And I and give a special shout out to Lisa Hood, um, our Public Engagement Specialist. Um, the report highlights dozens of events and approaches we took uh, to get input on plans like MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and the Regional Vision Zero Plan and, and, and a bunch of other activities. Um, we've established both a regional advisor, or sorry, a youth advisory panel and a civic advisory group to hear from groups that are often hard to reach. Um, we are much more intentional about reaching out to underrepresented communities and um, such as our Spanish speaking um, uh, folks as well. So please, when you get an opportunity, take a few minutes and read through that report. Last but not least, certainly not least, um, as, a, as uh, we communicated to you a few weeks ago, um, we lost a valued member of the Dr. Cog family. On April 30th, Connie Garcia lost her battle with cancer. And as many, many of you know, Connie was, if nothing else, she was forthright and she was certainly, and she was certainly a private and humble person. So a lot of people probably didn't know know her, her that well. Um, but one of the things few of us knew, knew, her, knew her really well was that she was, you know, really how generous she was. Um, as many of you know, I know we talk about it every year, um, Dr. Cog employees, um, we kind of adopt the Sparely Center, which is a long-term care facility over the holiday season. Um, and it's a completely volunteer, voluntary exercise. And most, most staff, they grab a couple names and associated wish list. Well, Connie, could always be counted on not only to organize the event, but also, um, you know, she would adopt it and shop with, um, with them, with, you know, for quite frankly, the most residents. She would always had a handful of those names and she would do that all herself. Um, and I know she, if she were sitting here today, she would be embarrassed, be embarrassed. I was even telling you that story, but I wanted you all to know how generous she truly was. Well, then, and this takes us now to uh, the resolution you have in front of you this evening that we have put together honoring Connery, Connie's time here at Dr. Cog. And with the chair's permission, I would like to read the resolution into the record. Please. Thank you, sir, very much. <clears throat> A resolution honoring the memory of Constance Ann Garcia and expressing appreciation for her distinguished and dedicated service to the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Whereas Constance, Connie, and Garcia passed away on April 30th, 2020, and whereas Connie Garcia had been a valued and respected staff member of the Denver Regional Council of Government since 1995, and whereas over 25 years, Connie Garcia exhibited an exceptional level of performance and effort in many key roles at Dr. Cog, and whereas Connie Garcia had a reputation for her extensive knowledge of the organization, its board of directors, and the communities it serves, and was gifted with forthrightness and utmost integrity, and leveraged this to the benefit of Dr. Cog and ultimately to the people of the region. And whereas, over her career, she supported multiple executive directors and countless board members, and was a valued and generous member of the Dr. Cog family. And now, there, there be it resolved, that the Denver Regional Council of Governments honors the memory of and expresses gratitude and appreciation for Constance Ann Garcia for her dedicated and distinguished service to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff. Be a further resolved that the Denver, that the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and staff extend their condolences to the family and friends of Connie Garcia. Resolved, passed, adopted this day, Denver, Colorado. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I, at this time, I, I respectfully ask for a motion to approve this, the resolution. Please, yes, thank you, uh, Executive Director Rex. Uh, I, I would like to ask for uh, for a motion and a second, and I would like to have time before we vote 
uh, for anyone who would like to speak to the resolution. So with that, Ms. Stevens, um, do you see a hand? Uh, I do. It looks like um, our first hand was from uh, Herb Atchison. Director Atchison, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> excuse me, got a problem. It would be my honor to recommend that the Board of Directors pass this resolution. Uh, honoring Connie Garcia, and then when the time is appropriate, I'd like to add a comment. Uh, thank you, Director um, uh, Atchison. Um, Ms. Stevens, do you have a second, please? Uh, yes, it looks like we do from uh, Kevin Flynn, Director Flynn. Thank you, Melinda. I would like to second that motion. Uh, thank you, Director Flynn. Okay, um, at, at this time, I would like to open the floor for uh, Comments on the resolution. I will I will turn um, uh, it over to Ms. Stevens, and she will select. And then, when there are no more uh, people who would like to speak to the motion, uh, she will hand it back to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like we do have another hand um, from Director Pfeiffer. Uh, Director Pfeiffer, go ahead. Thank you, Melinda. I just want to say that I absolutely support this resolution. As the former chair of Dr. Cog, Connie was a steady hand to the organization and provided us guidance and humanity in many ways. And when you're an executive officer, you can understand what I mean by that. And so therefore I would uh, and will be supporting this resolution. I do ask one favor of the board. I would ask that the entire board be listed on the resolution. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Pfeiffer. Uh, it looks like we do have uh, another comment from Director Atchison. Director Atchison, go ahead. Thank you very much. As Mr. Pfeiffer said, if you've been through the chair's position, we learned a long time ago who actually runs the Dr. Cobb. And mm -hmm. Doug Rex, no disparaging to your position, but we know that Connie Garcia has run this organization and kept all the executive directors in line and made sure they told the mark for many, many years. It was my pleasure to have known Connie, uh, not only on a business basis, but a personal basis. And I uh, recently had a conversation with Roxy Ronson, a very dear friend of hers and former employee. And as you said, Connie kept this issue very quiet and very private. Uh, as many of us tried to reach out to her in the last few months, we could not get her to return calls because she did not want to, this to be made public. But you could not find a more dedicated and committed individual to the job of the executive director's uh, right-hand person that Dr. Cog and Connie Garcia was. And one thing you could always depend upon Connie, if you needed a parking slip, she always had one for you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Director Atchison. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like we do not have any other uh, comments or questions. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, uh, just, just a few comments. Um, uh, as, a, as a newly elected official coming from Parker in 2012, um, coming into Dr. Cog was very overwhelming. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of information was needed to, to do my job. And uh, the first person you, you, you met was uh, Connie Garcia. And quite honestly, she scared the heck out of me. Um, she, was, uh, she was strong. She knew everything about Dr. Cog. Um, and she, uh, she didn't hesitate to, uh, to share. Um, when I was tapped by the uh, godfather of Dr. Cog at the time, Director Ron Murkowski, uh, to consider uh, being a part of this executive team, um, I talked to um, Connie. And I asked her, I go, Connie, I don't think I'm, I'm that person. And um, she gave me words of support. Uh, yes, you are. And, and from that point forward, she, um, um, she met with me. Um, she talked over issues and she was a, a, just a, a great resource um, for me. So uh, again, I, I truly appreciate all her years, years of service and all the, all the kind um, comments um, that, uh, that were being showered upon her. And um, just God bless you, Connie Garcia. Um, one one item, I guess, um, uh, Director Pfeiffer indicated a uh, listing of all the board members. Um, Director Atchison, um, friendly amendments. Is is that is that 
okay to you? No problem. Great. Um, Director Flynn, is that, is that acceptable as well since you seconded that motion? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, um, uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, could you um, unmute everybody so we can um, take a vote, please? Absolutely. I will unmute all members and alternates now, and uh, they should be able to speak. Great. Okay, all, all those in favor of the resolution honoring the memory of Connie Garcia, please say aye. 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 Yes, abstain. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, everybody. Truly appreciate it. Next item, item six, uh, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. For those of you who would like to uh, uh, provide public comment, please raise your virtual hand and Ms. Stevens will call upon you. Ms. Stevens? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lisa, did you want to take over at this time? Sure. Um, Melinda, if you'll unmute everybody who might, uh, if there's anybody that's on the phone, and we'll do that first. And then if anybody is on the computer, if you could just raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to speak. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I have unmuted everyone. So anyone that uh, wants to speak on the phones, they have the ability to. All right, so we're not hearing anybody on the phones, but I will call out the names who have raised their hand to speak. So our first speaker is Maureen McKenna. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just confirming you can hear me? Yes. And thank you, board members. Uh, I'm Maureen McKenna, Education and Safety Director with Bicycle Colorado, also representing the Denver Streets Partnership tonight. As we've expressed both to the TAC and the RTC, we are thrilled to see Dr. Cog stepping up to provide a toolkit to support local governments in the region to eliminate traffic fatalities. I'm sure you're very familiar at this point with the unwavering fundamental principles of Vision Zero, as well as our position on the plan as advocates. Despite the reassurances, and quite honestly, because of the contrasting explanations at the two committee meetings, we remain deeply concerned about adopting the plan as is without an explicit statement with a goal of zero traffic fatalities and a target date by which to reach that goal. Having read the plan several times, we see implied references to a goal of zero in places like page nine, which reads achieving the goal of vision zero involves everyone, but no unequivocal and concrete statement setting a goal for the region. Bicycle Colorado, the Denver Streets Partnership and our supporters are working hard to ensure a day where zero traffic fatalities is our reality because we've seen firsthand the impact of lost loved ones on friends and families. We've spoken to individuals who have lost loved ones in preventable traffic crashes and we've experienced loss ourselves. It is beyond devastating. The thought of telling grieving family members and a traffic that a traffic safety plan our organization should support is void of a clear goal of eliminating all traffic fatalities within a specified period of time is for us completely unconscionable. It should be for Dr. Cog too. Now is not the time for conversations about procedure to overrule the morality of declaring zero as the benchmark for the Denver region, nor is it the time to make promises Dr. Cog cannot guarantee it can keep. The people who live and work here deserve better. They deserve a vision zero plan that accepts nothing more than zero traffic fatalities. This moment requires a clear statement from a respected body such as Dr. Cog. For full transparency on the part of Dr. Cog and to avoid any continued confusion, we ask again that the plan be amended to state an explicit goal of zero traffic fatalities with a target date. If these measures won't be updated until Metro Vision 2050, the official current goal of fewer than 100 fatalities should be represented explicitly in the plan. And any discomfort with this proposal is a suggestion that Dr. Cog should be updating their target now. Bicycle Colorado and the Denver Streets Partnership ask that Dr. Cog and local governments use this action plan as an opportunity to show your own commitment to the people in your jurisdictions and making streets safe for all who use them. Thank you. 
Thank you, Maureen. Next up, we have Michelle Roche. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Michelle Roach, and I'm a 30-year Denver resident, and I'm speaking tonight to ask that Dr. Cog's Taking Action on Vision Zero plan take a strong, uncompromising, and documented stance, plainly stating a specific date for realizing Vision Zero. As the plan reads now, the goal is to achieve fewer than 100 deaths, and that is not a Vision Zero plan. On yesterday's TAC committee call, while several people said they believe zero deaths is the correct goal, no one spoke to committing to a specific date for the goal to be reached in this plan. And without a firm date and commitment holding leadership accountable to prioritizing the resources necessary to realize zero deaths, Dr. Cog's Vision Zero plan is not a Vision Zero plan. Before you vote on adopting this plan tonight, I'd respectfully like to ask each of you to consider something. What if you knew that unless you made the urgently needed changes that would make our city streets safe right now, not in 20 years or 30 years, but now, that your child or your deeply loved one would certainly be killed in a traffic crash? How would you respond? I realize that that may seem like a morbid question to ask that each of you take deeply personal consideration for the gravity of what you're voting on tonight as though it meant life or death. I can assure you that it does. And I know because I lost my child to traffic violence. Michael was killed four years ago by a speeding elderly drunk driver on a dangerous stretch of Yale Boulevard one block from home. From home. And his braces off. He was simply standing on the corner trying to get across the playground or across the street to the playground. But just about every crack in our broken system conspired that day to take his life. From the laws and system that failed multiple times to keep the woman that killed him from being behind the wheel in the first place, to the infrastructure that encouraged high speeds coming off of Colorado Boulevard into a densely populated neighborhood. The system failed miserably. And had a true Vision Zero plan already been in place, Cole might be alive today. He'd be entering his senior year of high school and just turning 18. We have it well within our means to implement practical, low-tech infrastructure like bike lanes, sidewalks, and lower speed limits, and to adopt policies that make distracted and impaired driving unconscionable by an ambitious target date. You have that authority. I implore you to exercise it. Commit to making your street, our streets safe with urgency and commit to a date for doing it. Hundreds of lives depend on it. Maybe someone's you love. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak? If so, please raise your hand using the raise hand button. Oh, I see Tracy Carpenter. Tracy, you should be unmuted now. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Carpenter, and um, my interest in traffic safety and advocacy is similar to Michelle's. Um, she just said that very, very well, so I'm kind of going to piggyback off of her. But I lost my aunt two years ago. Um, she was riding her bike across Downing, and a reckless driver speeding um, came and hit her, and she was killed in the crash. Um, so I, I really appreciate and praise um, for this action plan. Um, the goal of zero um, isn't stated in the, in the plan, but but it should be. If it's a vision zero plan, it, uh, it should be zero fatalities. Um, we have a, even a sign up in our yard, and we spread the sign, you know, all over our community that it's that it's vision zero. And so I really would like to see. Um, the consistency in that plan. Um, any number other than zero is unacceptable. Um, for example, my aunt um, would be one of those, if it's 100 or less, could be one of those 100, which is saying that it's okay that you know 100 are killed, which we know is not. And so um, I really would like to see the consist consistency with this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Is there anybody else 
that would like to speak? All right, Chair, I'll pass it back to you. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to close public comment at 7.06 p.m. Um, on to the next part of the agenda, the consent agenda. Item seven, uh, I would like, uh, I would need a motion to approve the consent agenda. If, as always, uh, you would like to pull an item from the consent agenda, please feel free to raise your hand now. Ms. Stevens, are we, uh, do we have any hands raised? Uh, it does actually look like we have a hand raise from uh, Tammy Maurer. Let me go ahead. Uh, it doesn't look like she has the ability to speak though. Um, oh, Tammy, are you there? Yeah, I'm using my phone. Um, there you go. Yeah, I move to approve the consent agenda. Uh, thank you, Director Mara. Uh, Mara. Ms. Stevens, uh, can you um, unmute, please, so we can get a second and then a subsequent vote? Absolutely, I'll do that now. Okay, so we can get a verbal second from any of the other directors. Second. Yes. Second. Fantastic. We have a we have a second. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Aye. Abs against? Abstain? Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next part of the agenda, the action items. Uh, item eight, uh, discussion of the Dr. Cog Regional Multimodal Freight Plan. Mr. Helfand. Good evening, Matthew Helfant, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog, and we're pleased to bring the uh, Dr. Cog's Regional Multimodal Freight Plan before you this evening for your consideration of adoption. Um, the, the, the current plan, as many of you may know, was last adopted in 2016 as part of the 2040 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, and working with Dr. Cog's staff an advisory committee that includes industry representatives and staff from many of your jurisdictions, uh, Cambridge Systematics has completed a draft of, of the updated component. And the, the ultimate purpose for this plan is to serve as a blueprint for the regional planning partners, the private sector, and others to conduct more detailed planning of the movement uh, of goods in the, in the Dr. Cog region. And we have Evan Anderson, uh, from Cambridge Systematics this evening to provide you a briefing. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Matthew. And, and Matthew, could you confirm that you can see the, the presentation on your screen? I, let's see, uh, yes, I can. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction and, and thank you for your time this evening. Um, we're gonna give a quick overview of, of what Matthew talked about and introduce this plan and, and ask for adoption. So this is a key element of um, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, as Matthew suggested, Dr. Cog first um, started looking more closely at emerging freight issues in 2016. And, and this plan is really an attempt to continue to um, drill into the available data, understand the issues, coordinate with private sector partners, and make freight a more integrated component um, overall of the, of the regional transportation plan, as it is a, a truly integrated component of, of our transportation system and, and how supply chains function, which I think we're all very well aware of um, these days. So this, this kind of key element really set out to engage industry and stakeholders um, on a much more consistent basis, um, really set out to kind of just document some of our existing conditions, drawing on available data, um, and really provide some baseline information that was consistent with the statewide freight plan developed um, by the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, some of the, the key outcomes of the plan overall was really developing that inventory of, of current needs, looking at um, problem areas, solutions, potential investment areas related to safety and trends and conditions, connectivity, and freight mobility. Um, it also identifies a, a regional um, freight priority network, similar to some of our other key elements of the regional transportation plan, and does identify kind of future freight focus areas that would be um, ideal for local study and coordination um, and maybe well-deserving of um, independent study to understand how freight is influencing different parts of our region altogether. 
So again, we really had um, great uh, partner engagement throughout this. Um, the advisory committee, again, was uh, many of your um, staff and local jurisdictions from across the region, as well as some key partners from the Colorado Motor Carriers Association um, and BNSF Railways were, were also key components here. We did hold freight forums specifically for um, business needs where we um, drew on maps and identified needs. Um, worked with those those industry partners and business partners to conduct overall surveys um, and provide a kind of online map for specific comments and we got a whole host of very specific um, local issues um, great comments and you can kind of see some of the overall um, concerns down there in the corner on safety sustainability maintenance and expansion uh, ranked from most important to least important our advisory committee was, was fully engaged. We met on a, a monthly basis throughout this effort, and they really tasked us to um, really describe um, the connections between freight and the regional economy, uh, some of the key industry clusters that make Denver competitive, um, really looking at some of our existing assets, including um, the Aerotropolis, the Spaceport, I think um, first and last mile and parcel delivery issues, particularly in downtown cores and, and suburban areas. Um, are very, very critical and, and very um, highly visible issue that we're seeing now. Lots of interest in um, developing future distribution and logistics activity centers, um, really coordinating that with, with rail investments and air investments, both within the region and those that are serving um, demand and markets um, outside of the region. And then really trying to um, get down to, you know, what potential improvements can um, Dr. Cog and our regional partners uh, make in the coming years to really um, address key issues um, and help enable the freight system to work um, safely, efficiently. Um, they're also really interested in kind of how do we tell the story of freight. Um, it's, it's very, again, visible, but it has a significant economic impact overall in the region. And there's lots going on in the freight sector. Um, technology ad adaptation, um, looking at the next generation of, of drones and, and robots and automated delivery systems. They're kind of cutting edge and emerging things there. Um, lots of different policies happening for parcel delivery, um, how we can kind of manage and uh, manage our curbside assets, uh, reduce demand and trips associated with e-commerce and, and parcel delivery. And then really um, addressing freight issues does require um, integrated planning at all levels, um, addressing land use, and really continuing the, the great record of private and public sector collaboration um, through Dr. Khan's planning efforts. Overall, the, the report is, is relatively simple and accessible. And these are some of the kind of key chapters. I'm just going to walk through some of the, the key components there. But we do de detail out everything that we heard from our engagement efforts, efforts um, through the public and through our, our industry and business partners. Again, safety, um, truck parking is, is a critical need, especially with new federal regulations, but also significant interest in improving the safety of railroad crossings, of which there are a significant number um, across the region. And then understanding how trucks interact with other travelers, particularly pedestrian bicyclists, and again, downtown cores and other areas um, will become increasingly important. Lots of interest on, again, future development opportunities, um, some of the investments that we could make to, to really make the region competitive. Um, uh, again, looking how we can advance private sector efforts um, to improve the sustainability um, of, of the overall industry. Most of those efforts are being uh, led by industry right now, but there's a lot of potential out there. Again, lots of interest in technology and delivery issues. Um, curb management in particular is, is kind of a critical effort. Um, and then that coordination angle was increasingly important to, to many of our business partners as well. They are just as interested in, in learning what um, investments and improvements are planned um, as we are learning um, about their data and, and needs um, related to the freight system. Uh, second chapter really kind of does try to tell the story of, of freight and economy, um, looking at those uh, number of direct jobs that are um, tied to transportation, trade, and logistics, um, as well as the significant portion, over a half a million um, jobs in industries that depend um, on kind of day-to-day -day core business activities of, of moving goods from, from one place to another, which is um, anywhere from a third to a quarter of the entire regional economy. Um, Denver really is the, the distribution center for not just Colorado, but the entire, mount, uh, entire Mountain West, particularly on petroleum and, and motor vehicle products. 
um, with significant um, rail and our modal facilities directly within Dr. Cog's region, a lot of the value of products are moving there. The majority of uh, products um, by value and tonnage do move by truck, um, but railroad and air freight are very, very critical to uh, moving high value, uh, low weight goods throughout the region. As we suggested earlier, the advisory committee was very interested in kind of defining an, an aspirational um, freight vision network. And, and so this was a, a look at how different components of, of existing systems fit together to help serve freight needs. And in reality, every single alley and, and driveway and, and streets and highway and interstate um, serve the freight network and, and carry goods to businesses and, and homes. Um, and this way we took kind of a look at, at priority tiers, looking at the already identified National Highway Freight Network, um, which has an official designation under the FAST Act and, and is eligible for different grants and funding. Looking at the National Highway System, which includes a lot of the, the key arterials and state highways um, and really does carry a significant portion of truck traffic um, across the country and throughout the region. And then there are also a number of really critical um, intermodal um, and local connectors that um, the businesses, freight carriers, and shippers um, use to access key intermodal hubs um, throughout the region, to bypass congested spots, um, to access kind of major distribution centers. And so we've also identified those um, in concert with business partners and the advisory committee. A significant portion of the plan really does detail um, many of the regional and local best practices that are out there across the country. Um, again, freight planning at the local and regional and city level is, is still an emerging issue, um, but there's a, a great examples from the, from the city of Se Seattle, from Tampa, from others, to really help understand how freight can work with other street uses um, in our cities, how we can again kind of manage our curb space and our assets, um, and then also things like the North Metropolitan Industrial Area Connectivity Study, which is a joint effort of, of jurisdictions across the region, really helped identify very specific um, local improvements that were needed. Um, again, realizing that freight is a regional, but also very much a local issue. The plan does identify a number of um, key overarching strategies. Number one is the need to continue Dr. Cog's efforts to really develop um, a comprehensive and continual um, Freight planning and goods movement plans overall. This could be an entirely significant effort within itself. Um, and again, this was a, an iteration and a blueprint for continuing Dr. Cog's efforts. Um, the plan really does encourage local area and site specific freight plans, um, provide some recommendations for how to integrate thinking about freight and goods movements into all the planning and design that we do, do including uh, Vision Zero plans and how we can enhance safety for all travelers there. Um, and then again, kind of looks at that coordination um, angle with, with land use and development, um, as well as the need to kind of preserve our regional freight infrastructure. Um, Denver does have a number of industrial hubs, um, short line railroads, and others that can be repurposed for entirely different future mobility needs or to serve um, a future freight technology. As I mentioned um, earlier, the, the plan also identifies kind of freight focus areas that are um, identified with business partners and activity centers, and these would be um, ideal for continuing local study and regional planning um, to better understand the key drivers of freight within these areas and the opportunities for economic development um, that might be associated with those. So again, uh, thank you to all our advisory committee members who have participated in this overall plan. Um, this is a kind of a strategic framework and a blueprint and really does encourage future um, action. It provides that basic information, um, trends and conditions, and potential investment needs. But there's a lot, of, a lot more data that could be um, brought to bear to really understand the, the different solutions and investment possibilities that are out there. Um, again, it's, it is really very critical to consider freight and goods movements and, and all the planning aspects that we do, um, particularly in the kind of local studies and corridor plans so we understand the, the different impacts and perhaps unintended consequences of the freight planning. And then overall, it really does emphasize kind of that continuing coordination, partnerships with the private sector, uh, data sharing as, as really kind of key to future implementation and action. We can look to other, other successful regions across the country that have done that. So overall, that was a, a very brief overview of this plan. And again, thank you to um, Matthew and Jacob for, for leading this effort and turn it. Matthew, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Thank you, Evan. Uh, the motion before you this evening is to recommend adoption of the regional multimodal freight plan. And we'd be happy to take any questions or comments at this time. Um, thank you, Mr. Helfand. Um, directors, at this time, if you have questions uh, on this item, please raise your hand. Ms. Stevens, I will turn it over to you for questions. Mr. Chairman, if, if Mr. Chairman, this is Doug Rack speaking, sure. if I may. Um, yes. And just, just an edit to the motion. The motion is to adopt the regional multimodal freight plan. Okay. I think Thank that's you. an old motion from RTC. I appreciate it. Ms. Stevens, right. is, is there anybody uh, out there? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question is from uh, Jeff Baker. Director Baker, you can go ahead and make your question or comment. Thank you very much. This is Jeff Baker from Arapahoe County. And I, I, I can tell a lot of hard work went into this, um, this plan and uh, I wanna commend everyone. I did have one question, try to get a little bit more granular on um, Santa Fe, um, State Highway 85, the area that appears to be highlighted appears to be only in the very southern portion. And I'm just wondering, can you specify a little bit more about the boundaries of, of that part of the plan? Evan, did you want to take this first? Yeah, thank you for that that comment, Director. Um, and I, I really should have noted that these circles that you're seeing and, and the area that's indicated on the on the US 85 are are really very illustrative um, and and not intended to be taken as a very specific geography. In reality, that entire key corridor, um, you know, connecting the region to I-25 and the Ports to Plains um, corridor along 287 are, are critical. So the the circles do not um, are not intended to denote a very specific geography, but more to indicate general areas or corridors where there's a lot of significant activity. All right, thank you very much. I just wanted to stress that when the large fire happened on I-25, the amount of traffic, uh, freight traffic in, and passenger traffic that increased on Santa Fe was so large, I really think that that demonstrated the need to consider um, that um, avenue, that corridor from uh, as far south to as far north as it goes. It should be uh, uh, considered a critical freight corridor. Thank you. All right, and I'll thank just, you so much. I'll just, I'll, Go ahead, Matthew. I'll just, I'll, I'll just note, um, that uh, obviously these are circles and they're not, you know, they're all perfect circles. So they're not showing every single little detail, but uh, the, the, these circles represent recommendations for, for additional uh, study. All right, thank you, Matthew. Uh, did that answer everything in its entirety, Director Baker? Yes, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. All right, it looks like um, our next question or comment is from uh, Roger Partridge. Uh, Roger, or Director Partridge, you can unmute yourself and speak. Thank you, so great presentation, and I agree with Commissioner Baker, you know, some a lot of work and detail went into this and, and very important for our freight industry, no doubt. I'd like to make a comment on Highway 85 being a tier two. We really believe the importance of Highway 85, and I'm looking at what is in you know, Rappo County and mostly Douglas County. When you look at the amount of traffic, of, of freight traffic that is on E4, excuse me, C470 and I-25, Highway 85 feeds both of those. In fact, they're, they're alternate route when you look at I-25 especially. A special note is too, Highway 85 in Douglas County is a high industrial area and it is a, no doubt there's a lot of, um, no, and it's not necessarily piggyback, but a lot of auto industry drop off along that. So there's major, you know, truck traffic and you have a major aerospace in industry of Lockheed Martin that accesses 
Highway 85. So I would really like to see Highway 85 move to a tier one and uh, would just like to have some explanation, you know, to that and uh, discussion a little bit of that with Matthew. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Partridge. Um, I'll start and then Evan could probably add a little bit, but um, perhaps it's slightly misleading that uh, we have, we, we label each as a different tier. It, it's not meant to, to say that um, the, the tier two or the tier three are less important than the tier one. It was more to distinguish the different networks that are in the system. And the National Highway Freight Network is uh, defined uh, by, the, by the federal government. And so we wanted to have that as, as, as the first layer, uh, just, just for um, uh, illustrative purposes. And so it, it, um, every, every single corridor that, that we highlight here is incredibly important to the region. And I'll, I'll let um, Evan uh, uh, expand upon that. So thank you, Matthew. I think that does kind of clarify that, that these are kind of layers that, that are intended to, again, to work together um, to really provide that, that seamless overall system. Um, you know, and one of the things that we ended up kind of looking at how we, how these existing designations and layers fit together um, was also kind of a result of the absence of really having a, an in-depth understanding of um, truck movements, you know, both in and, and out the region on every single um, road. You know, we, we really look to, um, you know, traffic and truck counts on the state highway system are reasonably good. On many other systems, um, they really are not great. And so we really don't know necessarily how much activity is going on around that Lockheed uh, Martin facility. And, and so it doesn't pop, so to speak, in our, in our data. Um, so I actually would really encourage, you know, one of the recommendations of this plan really does address data. And one thing that could, could be better is that um, utilizing the, the new potential data sources that are out there um, to really understand the over the road, long distance trucks, but also those kind of key critical local movements that again are, are very visible to uh, constituents and, and oftentimes how people think of, of freight and goods. So with better data, we'd be able to identify a better overall vision network is a short answer. <laughs> uh, okay, very good. Uh, Matthew, you mentioned that it's, you know, per federal guidelines, but Matthew, you're you're an inf influential guy. Can't you just call the feds up and fix it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have to lobby Congress to do that. Uh, but, um, <laughs> and I'll give it a try. Okay. All right, we back you on that big guy. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, thank you, Director Partridge. It uh, looks like our next question or comment is from uh, Tammy Maurer. So, Director Maurer. Director Maurer, are you there? Hi. There I you am. go. I just had to, un I had to unmute myself. Um, I was just curious, uh, Matthew, when you were talking about truck parking, is this also for like um, truck stops? that you are looking at as well. I know that uh, Colorado had a shortage on those areas and that I know that another one was removed at um, I-70 and Vasquez, making it even less of a problem for drivers where they do their overnight stops. So I was just wondering if um, you had looked at that. Well, um I'll, I'll, once again, I'll start, and, and Evan can probably expand upon it. But um, when, when we talk about truck parking, we, we talk about um, uh, truck stops as well. Um, this is a critical issue, uh, not only for the Denver region, but for the entire state. Um, Evan and I both attended uh, recently uh, a full-day forum at CDOT with uh, professionals from across the industry uh, to discuss this issue and and try and find solutions. Uh, so uh, uh, truck parking is 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 clearly a critical issue, and we're working with CDOT uh, to, to to find solutions. That's good. Exactly. Thank you very much. That's all I needed. I just needed to know that you guys were addressing that problem. 
So it's, and this is Evan just just to piggyback on that. So so yes, very much an emphasis on that kind of um, you know highway truck stops and and key rest areas where drivers need to take mandatory you know eight hours or overnight breaks. Um, one of the things that we don't under, understand necessarily, and again, oftentimes this points to data, is the, the need for truck parking around some of the major distribution centers on off streets, oftentimes even residential neighborhoods, as they're um, backing mm-hmm. up or queuing to get into um, uh, Sunco or um, Miller Coors or a number of kind of major distribution centers. Um, that is a, a kind of a, a local problem that, that you may very well hear, and again, one that isn't necessarily understood um, or that isn't necessarily being addressed um, by many of CDOT's efforts or, or FHWA's oh. efforts. And again, an opportunity for local coordination um, to better understand those those very small micro issues. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Evan and Matthew, and thank you, Director Maurer. Uh, And at this time, I'm not seeing any other hands raised, so I will turn it back to our chair. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, So with with all the questions being being addressed, uh, I am open to entertain a motion. Um, Ms. Stevens, please let me know if there is a hand raised to entertain a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do from Director Atchison. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, I'd move to approve the adoption of the Dr. Cog Regional Multimodal Freight Plan. Thank you, Director Atchison. Uh, at this time, Ms. Stevens, uh, can you open the, uh, unmute the uh, the line so we can get a second and a subsequent vote? This is a least second. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, we have a second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Against, abstain, motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, The next uh, item on the action item part of the agenda, item nine, discussion of taking action on the Regional Vision Zero Plan. Ms. Dolobaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Beth Alba. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog and the project manager for Regional Vision Zero. And we'll be presenting highlights on the draft plan of taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Um, I'll go ahead and assume one second my slide's lagging. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and assume that most present today are familiar with the concept of Vision Zero. But just as a quick reminder, um, Vision Zero is the transportation safety philosophy based on the principle that the loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. It reframes traffic deaths as preventable. It integrates human error. It focuses on preventing fatal and severe crashes. It aims to establish safe systems. It applies data-driven decision-making and establishes road safety as a social equity issue. To give some background on why the Denver region needs Vision Zero, in 2017, 266 people were killed in the Denver region streets and highways, and that is a 50% increase region-wide since 2013. And if you look at the percent of crashes by travel mode versus the percent of fatal crashes by travel mode, you will see the large percent of fatal crashes involve people walking, biking, and on motorcycles, showing that we need to make a point to focus on these vulnerable users as we implement regional safety initiatives. This map here is included in the plan and illustrates KSI crashes from the years 2013 to 2017, which is the five years of data that was used for the analysis included in this plan. 1,149 people died, 8,827 people were seriously injured during that time in the Denver region. That's almost 10,000 people that were affected by these types of crashes in this five-year period of time. There has been extensive conversation on what Dr. Target, Dr. Cog's target is and should be. We would like to reiterate that Dr. Cog is committed to a target of zero. Every life matters and no fatality is acceptable. Um, this is clearly stated in the Regional Vision Zero video we released at the beginning of plan development. Um, the link to that video is also included in the plan. And the main purpose of this plan is to identify strategies the region needs to take to work towards reaching Vision Zero. Um, I wanted to thank the members of the public who came and shared their stories tonight. These fatalities are heartbreaking and preventable, 
and these stories really put in perspective the seriousness and importance of Vision Zero. So again, I want to reiterate, our regional target is zero. This plan's adoption is ahead of schedule of two other plans that are involved in the target setting process at Dr. Cog. These two other plans involved are MetroVision, which includes Dr. Cog's overarching themes, outcomes, and performance measures. This slide shows the current 2040 targets that were established. Um, this is where the target of fewer than 100 fatalities annually lives. Please keep in mind that this 2040 target was set years before Vision Zero was being initiated. Um, we also have the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, also known as the MVRTP. Um, as you hopefully know, Dr. Cog's staff is currently working on the 2050 MVRTP. As part of the 2050 MVRTP, Dr. Cog will be updating and reinsessing these 2040 targets to 2050 targets, and that is when we plan to include the target of zero. These targets must be approved by this board, and once it is, we plan on amending taking action on Regional Vision Zero to include these new adopted safety targets. Um, there is extensive public outreach done for this plan. Um, as I mentioned, we kicked off the project with the Regional Vision Zero video, um, a short survey and an interactive map that allowed the public to select locations where safety issues throughout the, uh, with safety issues throughout the region. Um, we received 3,300 survey responses and over 1,000 interactive map comments. Um, this map is also included in the plan. It shows how the interactive map locations overlap with the data-driven regional hydro network. Um, as you can see from this map, the data-driven areas were pretty consistent with the locations the public identified. Um, the 30-day public comment period for this plan started March 19th and closed April 18th. Dr. Cog received over 200 comments from stakeholders in the public. Um, the comments are included in the Juno packet, packet with our responses. Um, I did want to thank all of our stakeholders who took the time to review the plan and, and submit comments. Um, we responded to the comments and included suggested changes in the plan. Um, where appropriate. So the block of the plan is the Regional Vision Zero Toolkit, which consists of the data-driven regional hydro network, um, crash profiles broken up by area type, uh, behavior profiles, and countermeasures. Start first with the um, regional hydro network. Um, it was developed by identifying roadway segments with the highest KSI crash density, KSI meaning killed and serious injury clashes. Um, please disregard the area squares on this map. They're simply showing what inset maps are included in the plan. There's also an interactive map link to go along with this map that include, that's included in the plan that has associated layers such as vulnerable population groups, um, regionally significant active transportation and transit layers, and we're hoping this will help assist local jurisdiction in identifying where the regional hydro network overlaps with these important areas. Um, since the regional network ended up being so large, staff decided to do a more detailed analysis and identify critical corridors along the regional hydro network. Um, to identify these corridors, each of the 10 counties within Dr. Cog were analyzed separately to ensure the critical corridors were dispersed regionally. For each county, the critical corridors identify the top 50% of KSI crash density corridors along the regional hydro network. And again, that was done by county. So once we identified where these crashes were occurring, we wanted to further, further analyze those crashes and figure out more details on possible contributing factors of those crashes, figure out some of the mechanics and behaviors involved and start moving towards certain countermeasures that the region would want to apply to reduce KSI crashes. On a regional scale, we know the region is very diverse from a land use perspective. Crashes in rural areas are very different from what's going on in crashes in downtown Denver. So one of the first thing we did was develop four different area types, urban, um, suburban, compact communities, rural, and limited access highways. Um, and we did this using a variety of data sources to reflect the different built environments throughout the region. We identified three things within each area type, first being the crash profiles, which looked into specific events and types of crashes that are occurring. These inform the infrastructure countermeasures that are identified in the plan. Um, second, the behavior profiles, which are the human behaviors that led to the crashes happening. Um, one interesting thing we discovered is that the crash profiles are different for each area type in terms of what's causing the crashes, but behavior profiles are for the most part consistent um, in all the area types. So um, that was just something interesting that we learned going through this process. Um, and then lastly, we wanted to identify countermeasures, which are strategies that are recognized as best practices for addressing and reducing identified crash types. Um, taking action. This portion of the plan identifies objectives and action initiatives that we, as a region, need to work towards. 
Um, there are six main objectives in the plan. Those are improve, improve collaboration between allied agencies, increase awareness and adoption of Vision Zero, design and retrofit roadways to prioritize people's safety, improve data collection and reporting, increase funding and resources, and increase legislative support. This is an example of objective one, improve collaboration between allied agencies. Um, this objective has two main action initiatives. Those action initiatives have sub-actions to better identify tasks within the action initiatives. It identifies who will be responsible, who will take lead on the action initiatives, and what year these actions will begin. Um, this is pretty much so how all the objectives are set up. There's 25 different action initiatives identified in the plan. Um, there's also performance metrics that are identified for each action initiative that Dr. Cog will be tracking annually to determine which action initiatives we're making progress on or which ones we need to put more attention towards them, et cetera. Um, the plan identifies multiple ways local jurisdictions can get involved in the upcoming years, um, such as participating in the working groups, participating in training opportunities, collecting local data, applying for grants, um, joining the Vision Zero network, which is a good source for safety information. Um, just a few things Dr. Cog is currently working on. Obviously, getting this plan adopted is going to be a huge milestone for this initiative, but this is just the beginning. Um, we are already getting started with um, implementing implementing a few things. Um, Dr. Cog is working alongside CDOT to release the Urban Arterials Multimodal Safety Improvements Call for projects um, that will allocate between 20 to 77, 50 to 77 million dollars to safety projects and that prioritizes the regional high degree network that's identified in the plan. Um, we're working with FHWA to host a pedestrian safety workshop May 27th to 28th that is going to be very project-based. Um, we have around 30 partners who will be participating in this workshop, and we plan on organizing more workshops similar to this uh, moving forward. We currently have an RFP out for the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit that will build on the calendar measures listed in the plan. Um, I'm working on organizing the Regional Vision Zero Working Group. Um, we're hoping to have our first meeting for this sometime early next month. Um, I'm also working with our engagement specialist to establish a public education and engagement plan moving forward, um, which we'll vet those ideas through the working group before any final plans are established for that. Um, so with that, Dr. Song's staff is asking the board to move to approve adoption of taking action on regional vision zero with the caveat that staff revisit the issue of a specific target date and the 2050 MVRTP process. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions or take comments. Thank you, Ms. Dol Dolabala. Um, Board members, uh, at this time, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and Ms. Stevens will be in a position to call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first question or comment is from Aaron Brockett. Uh, Director Brockett, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Great, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that presentation and for this uh, really excellent document. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, all the different uh, measures that you've laid out in the analysis, as well as the next steps. So uh, very excited about this and really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to pick up on the couple of the, the comments that we heard. Um, so I understand uh, talking about the uh, revisiting that um, target date um, when we um, update that, um, the, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but when we revise those targets officially uh, addressing that then. So that makes sense. But uh, cor correct me if I missed it, but I, I didn't see in looking through the document that we do um, uh, that we do have a target of zero fatalities and serious injuries. It, is that stated anywhere in the document? We do not have the specific target stated within the tar within the document. Um, we do state within the document that Dr. Cog is committed to Vision Zero. Got it. Do you, do you think there would be any problem with, with just adding in, um, maybe in the preamble, uh, that we do have a, a without uh, understanding that we're not setting a date in this necessarily, but that we do have a target of zero uh, fatalities and serious injuries? Um, Ron, would you like to take that question or do you want me to take a stab at it? Um, I'm happy to, happy to chime in. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations. Um, thank you, Director Brockett, for the question. It's, it's, it's important, and I, I think we believe that the action of adopting, um, taking action on Regional Vision Zero, adopting the Vision Zero plan, does stake out our position that our, our goal is 
um, zero fatalities on the transportation system in this region. Um, and to actualize that as a target um, really requires an amendment to the MetroVision um, plan, um, which has a very prescribed process to it. And we think the appropriate time to do that is on the heels of the 2050 plan. We'll, we'll be incorporating a lot of the policies and recommendations from the from the Vision Zero plan into the RTP and then subsequently into MetroVision. Um, I will just say procedurally, um, I, I would suggest that the board um, indicate may, perhaps um, as part of the discussion its commitment to Vision Zero and Zero Fatalities um, rather than amend the plan just because we think it's appropriate and urgent to adopt this plan and start the wheels in motion for our work. And a, a board revision of the plan now would just delay that by sending it back to the Regional Transportation Committee for reconsideration. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, it makes sense. So I'll, I'll let other people ask questions and, um, and I'll come back to it. All right, thank you so much, Director Brockett. Um, <clears throat> Our next question was uh, typed in, but I'm going to go ahead and unmute uh, Director Partridge so he may ask his uh, question for the record. Go ahead. Ron, thank you for that answer. I, I think that clarifies a lot. My particular question was, was regarding if there was a zero target put in, or would that particular performance affect any funding formulas? It wouldn't it would not affect any fun, funding now. Great, thank you. All right, thank you so much Director Partridge. Uh it looks like our next question or comment will be from uh Director Stolzman. You may go ahead and unmute yourself and make your comment or question. Thank you. I just I'd like to just clarify um, with Director Papsdorf. I mean, it is the it is the board of directors' prerogative to amend the plan if we would care to at this time. I just like to clarify that with you. That is absolutely correct. Okay. And did that answer your question, Director Solzman? Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And then we will move on to. Uh, Elise Jones, Director Jones, you may go ahead and make your question or comment. Uh, thank you so much. And I too want to echo uh, Director Brockett's compliments for the great document and all the efforts that went into it. I do find myself among the folks, including um, the members of the public that testified it so eloquently on feeling like the, um, the document would be greatly improved by explicitly stating that it's our goal to reach zero fatalities and setting a date for that because if we don't measure progress in a real clear way we don't get there and I hear Dr. Cog's staff saying hey we have to go through the MetroVision amendment process in order to amend that target so I guess I'm trying to figure out what's the what's the compromise or balance there so one I have a question which is under um, the staff's timeline, when would we get to the place of actually adopting a specific metric or considering adoption of a specific metro of zero fatalities and putting a date on that? And then second question on whether or not um, when we make a motion to adopt this plan, if we could include in the language of the motion, so it's somewhere there in writing, that it's our intention of adopting a, 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 the goal of zero and um, looking at a target date through um, the Metro Vision process. So two questions there. Um, for your first question, we're planning on adopt adopting the 2050 MBRTP next spring, so it would be under a year. And as of now, it does state in the proposed motion that um, there is a caveat that staff will re revisit this specific target in the 2050 process. I don't see why we couldn't change that to better define what that target is. Thank you very much, that's helpful. Yeah, and um, sorry, Director Jones, this is Ron Papsdorf again. Just to clarify the 
the motion that came out of the Transportation Advisory Committee and was um, endorsed by the Regional Transportation Committee is to re not revisit the issue of the goal of, of zero deaths, is to revisit the issue of a specific target date for reaching zero deaths. Um, so I think there's a recognition here that adoption of the Vision Zero Plan is establishing the region's goal of zero fatalities on the region's transportation system. The question is just officially adopting a target date for achieving that in the context of Metro Vision and the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Um, I guess I, I, I appreciate it that it's the staff's intention um, that the that the words of adopting the regional vision zero means that we're actually effectively adopting the goal. But I, I guess I use those words slightly differently. One is a sort of a vision feels aspirational. Setting a goal is something more concrete. So I just I, I'm wondering if we can make that motion clearer in a way that you'd feel comfortable with. I, I don't see why we couldn't do that yet. Can I ask the staff what they would feel comfortable with and or would you like us to suggest a wordsmith? Um, Director Jones, from my perspective, and um, we we are fully committed to um, zero deaths and vision zero. Uh, we've put a lot of time and effort in this plan. I think we've we've shown um, our commitment to this and our the seriousness with which we take this issue. Um, and we're really proud of the very initial steps we're taking and really appreciate the, the strong partnership with CDOT to help us make some meaningful investments in the near term on improvements that will address safety. Not gonna solve all our problems right away, but a, a really significant um, initial investment. Um, with that said, look, we will we will accept whatever whatever the prerogative of the board is. Um, this is this is this is your plan um, for your jurisdictions um, that make up this region, and uh, we will we will take the board's direction. Thanks, Director, jo Director Jones. Did you have a, a did you want to spend some time to wordsmith and then come back to this, or would you like to address it at this point? Well, maybe other um, directors could um, provide comment on whether or not they're in agreement with the notion of, I guess, I, I want to recognize that the staff feel like we have to use the Metro Vision um, process to set a target date. I, I'm ready to see that, but I guess I would say that, say that um, we're also going to explicitly adopt the goal of zero fatalities. Mm -hmm and revisit the issue of a specific target date in the 2050 process is how I would word, word that motion. So I'm just curious if other directors agree with that or not. Okay, uh, we, we, will, uh, we will continue on with the, uh, with the questions. And um, again, feel free to chime in. Uh, it's very difficult for me sitting in this virtual position. I cannot read the room. I don't, I don't have faces in front of me. So um, I am anxiously awaiting additional questions and comments. Um, Ms. Stevens, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it looks like our next comment or question would be from Director Stolzman. Uh, so you can go ahead and speak. Thank you. Uh, I just would say that I'm supportive of Director Brockett and Director Jones's proposal to include an explicit target of zero fatalities and put in a target date of 2050 or 2040 or something. And then when we go through the Metro Vision process, we can update that as well. Um, I would, I'd like one clarification from staff. If we change the motion this evening, doesn't it also have to go back to RTC so that they approve the same motion that we approve? So whether we whether we modify the motion or whether we modify the document, wouldn't it have to go back to RTC? Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Stoltzman, um, that's correct. Thank you. So I guess I would just as soon modify the document if we're going to send it back to RTC. All right, uh, thank you, Director Stolzman. Um, looks like our next question or comment will be from uh, Jacob LeBure. Uh, Director LeBure, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and say I support um, Director Jones and her uh, proposition. Thanks. 
All right. Thank you, Director LeBure. I appreciate that. Um, our next question or comment would be from uh, Joan Peck. Director Peck, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I want to chime in with uh, support of Director Jones and Brock and Stoltzman's suggestions. But my question is, um, since RTC's recommendation was to put a target date in, cannot this amendment be that we are accepting RTC's uh, direction for a target date, and that would be the amendment without sending it back to RTC? Um, <clears throat> Director Peck, this is Ron Papstrow. I the the recommendation from the Transportation Advisory Committee and um, adopted by the Regional Transportation Committee actually was not to set a date. It was direction to staff to revisit the issue of establishing a specific date as part okay. of the development of the 2050 RTP. Okay, I would be very much in favor of having uh, the target be zero deaths by uh, since this is a 2050 plan by by 2050. All right, thank you, Director Peck, for your comment. Um, it looks like we, uh, again, have an additional comment or question from Director Stolzman. Go ahead. I, I don't have another comment. My hand just wasn't put down. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Appreciate that. Uh, then it looks like our uh, next question or comment would be from Director Brockett. Go ahead. Well, it, it sounds like comments are pretty much done, so I'm happy to offer up a motion to for discussion if if that's acceptable to the chair yes um please director brockett okay well uh, since uh, uh, director stolzman pointed out that that this would have to go back um for additional approval re regardless of whether we update the motion or the document i thought i would suggest an alteration to the document um so and and happy to have people you know correct uh, a little bit of language or what have you but i'll go ahead and move that we approve the adoption of uh, the taking action on Regional Vision Zero um, with the caveat that staff revisit the issue of a sp specific target date in the 2050 process, as well as to uh, add a sentence to the what is Vision Zero section um, of the plan itself uh, to state that, um, uh, quote, uh, by adopting um, this plan, uh, Dr. Cog affirms a, a target of zero uh, fatalities and serious injuries on our transportation system. Thank you, Director Brockett. Um, do, we have a, do we have a second? This is Director Olson. I would like to second that. Great. Okay. So let's open up for discussion on the proposed motion in the second before we, um, before it, we go. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Director sure, Brockett. Could, could, if I could just make one just comment on that motion, just that Please. I'm hearing that the revision um, is coming up within the year. I'm fine with leaving the setting of the target date up to that process, but I thought it was worth uh, affirming the target of zero fatalities and, and serious injuries within this plan itself. Okay. Um, I appreciate the, the additional uh, direction. Um, okay, so we have, a, we have a motion and a second uh, discussion on the motion. Ms. Stevens, is there anybody who is raising their hands. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like um, Director Jones is raising her hand. Director Jones, go ahead. So I would uh, like to speak in favor of the motion. I do think it's a compromise. I, I will state if it were up to me, I would set a target date tonight. The target date that Boulder County has set is 2035. Um, so I would you know, push hard and fast for that. Um, but again, I want to honor what I'm hearing from staff, which is we have a have a Metro Vision um, RTP process that's coming within the year, that that's the appropriate time to do that. So I think Director Brockett's um, motion helps clarify that it is our, that we are setting a goal for zero deaths and major injuries and um, clarifies that we're gonna set a target date within the year. So I would strongly support the motion. Thank you, Director Jones. <clears throat> okay, it looks like um, our next question or comment would be from Director uh, Nicholas Williams. Director Williams. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to echo kind of what Director Jones just said and support 
uh, Director Brockett's amendment. City and County of Denver set a very aggressive target with their Vision Zero plan of 2030. And I, I just do think it's critical to um, set that uh, goal of zero, making sure that's very clear, uh, making sure that we're moving towards that. And and you know, and I do agree with the conversation that you know, if we're going to 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 set that goal year by the end of the year through the RTP process, I think that's appropriate. All right, thank you, Director Williams. And it uh, looks like our next comment or question would be from uh, Director Brockett again. Director, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I just hadn't lowered my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Uh, I don't know if it's the same issue with uh, Director Jones. Yep, looks like she put her hand down. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chair, I see no additional hands raised. All right, um, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, all right, with with that, uh, we, will, uh, we will take a voice vote if, it, if we have fours and against, uh, I, I, I will phone a friend for help. Uh, so with that, uh, all in favor, aye. Uh, aye. 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 Against? against, abstain, motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the next part of the agenda is informational briefings. Uh, item 10, Metro Vision Performance Measures Annual Report. Uh, Andy, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. I'm Andy Taylor. Um, I work on regional planning uh, in the Regional Planning and Development Division here at Dr. Cog. I just want to thank you for your time and attention tonight. Uh, in much of our work, we focus on the region's plan, uh, Metro Vision. Uh, measuring and reporting on our progress towards the outcomes and the board adopted the board adopted through that plan is also a key part of our work. Um, first, I just want to back up and look at where this falls on the strategic planning model that helps organize all the work we do here at Dr. Koch. It starts with the mission and vision. The same mission and vision that the board adopted a few years ago is the same mission and vision for MetroVision. Where MetroVision picks up is in the themes, outcomes, and objectives. Uh, furthermore, it does also include regional and local initiatives down there at the bottom of that triangle, as well as 16 performance measures with corresponding targets for 2040. Uh, so uh, why did we include measures in the plan at all? Um, it's about trying to test and measure our collective impact. It's not about uh, looking at the impact of any one jurisdiction or any one single product. Uh, it's about having a set of information that can start to show whether we're moving towards the desired outcomes uh, in MetroVision itself. Uh, so how are we doing? This is the highest level view um, of those measures. Uh, we're on track or ahead of schedule on nine of the 16 measures to reach our target by 2040. Uh, we're behind schedule on six, and there's one that we have insufficient data since the baseline uh, to make any determination on status. For the sake of time, I'm going to step through information we've observed for one measure in each category. However, you can find similar information for all the measures in the slides attached to the memo. Uh, the slides do show numbers and charts, but have little explanation beyond what I'm sharing verbally tonight. Uh, but you can find more information on metrovision.drcog.org uh, at the link on your screen if you want to explore further or share it with others you know might be curious about this information. Uh, first, I'll just step you through um, what some of these slides look like that I'm showing about the measures themselves. I've included this slide just to orient some of the information at the top, you'll find the measure name or description. Uh, under that, you'll find the measure status, such as on track. Under that, still on the left side of the slide, you'll find observations listed in a table. And to the right, you'll see those observations charted out. Um, this is probably where the orientation is most key. The, the observations themselves are in the orange markers and any lines connecting those. Uh, the teal is a straight line between the baseline and the 2040 target. Now, not every path is gonna be a straight line, uh, even that we, we know some of these cases, that's not gonna be uh, how things turn out. 
uh, but we just want to show that so it's easy to see whether we're on track or not. So uh, the first one I've got up here uh, is related to housing near high frequency or rapid transit. We're currently ahead of schedule to meet the 2040 target of having 20% of the region's housing near high frequency or rapid transit. You can see a big jump with the opening of the A line, the first stop on the B line, and the flatter and flyer in 2016. Uh, we may struggle as a region uh, if we begin to lose some high frequency bus service that helps contribute uh, to this measure. Uh, we have some existing investments uh, that may reflect existing additional jumps uh, that aren't yet reflected in some of these observations with uh, the G and N lines. But the opportunity to remain on track uh, may, uh, but the opportunity to remain on track may be to add more housing in areas that remain uh, with a strong level of transit access. Uh, we're on track to meet the 2040 target of having 45% of the region's employment near high frequency or rapid transit. Uh, this measure is a close cousin to the one we just saw. Uh, the big jump that we saw in the last one in 2016, uh, it was a bit more pronounced on that last measure. But if it hadn't been for those new areas that we brought into this measure because of the transit system expansion, we would likely be behind schedule on this measure. Uh, it bears repeating that we're behind schedule to make progress towards our MetroVision target related to fatalities. Um, we've already heard a lot about it in the last item um, tonight. Uh, but unlike some of our other measures, we have a long uh, time series to look back on. Uh, when we adopted our target in 2017, it represented a much steeper decline than the long-term trend uh, suggested. However, since that time, our region has moved uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, with this report, we only have one measure that lacks sufficient observations to make a status determination. Uh, this is the only measure that falls under the theme healthy, inclusive, and livable communities. Uh, it looks at the combined housing and transportation costs and the share of people living in areas that would be affordable to the region's typical household. That'd be the household that has uh, the median income, the median household size, and the median number of commuters. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot to kind of take into this measure, but we've tried to put it in a way that'd be um, at least simpler to, to track and measure. Uh, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey does ask a number of questions about housing costs. However, it doesn't ask about transportation costs. Uh, we relied on the Center for Neighborhood Technology out of Chicago, uh, who had built a model to try and infer transportation costs from a number of other data points that they could observe. However, they have not repeated that work since 2017, which was actually based on 2015 survey data. Uh, so we on Dr. Cog staff are interested in researching some alternatives and workshopping some alternatives with the board before making a recommendation in a future plan amendment cycle um, to, to maybe replace or supplement this measure. Uh, at the chair's discretion, I'd entertain any inquiries about additional measures uh, for which you may have questions. Um, I've got them listed here, uh, but I wanted to just stay on time and talk about four, but I'm open to talking about any of the other measures that we have listed here. So I'll pause and, and see if the chair is amenable to that. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Stevens, if, if I'm um, sorry, board members, if there's any questions or um, desire to talk about additional uh, measures, please please feel free to raise your hand and Ms. Stevens will um, will call on you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have a hand raise um, from Jessica Sandgren, Director Sandgren, go ahead. Thank you, um, thanks for the presentation. It looks like the majority of data collected on there is back from 2018, is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct. And so when is the next data collection uh, for 2019, what will that be? look like I guess when will you add that in uh, so the, the the last set of data that we receive uh, for a couple of our measures comes in uh, December of the following year uh, so when we look at the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau they release their five-year numbers um, that would end in the year 2019 uh, they'll be releasing those in December 2020 those are the ones that lag uh, the longest for us there's several others that we um, uh, develop data sets for that don't get delivered until typically um, the middle of the year. So 
Um, there will be some 2019 numbers that uh, we may have data for, especially ones that we're developing in-house uh, for uh, June or July typically is when those are available. So we recognize there is some lag in what we're reporting here. Okay, and are you anticipating um, any particular that might have a way different outcome than you might have thought of just with the current situation? Uh, yes, um, one that we're keeping our eye on, eye on clearly is regional employment. Um, obviously, there's been lots of changes with that. Currently, based on 2018 numbers, we are showing that we are ahead of schedule. Um, we know that with recent uh, unemployment, uh, what, what's happened uh, at the beginning of this year, we know that uh, there's quite a bit that's changing that won't even show up in uh, the 2019 numbers. Uh, we do know that in much of the work that uh, the State Demography Office, the economist there has done, uh, he was actually factoring in some recession in some of his prediction. So this is something that does tend to go up and down, uh, but we anticipate that we won't remain on schedule um, at least for the 2020 number, uh, based on what we're seeing uh, so far this year. All right, thank you so much, I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Director Sandgren. Uh, looks like our next question or comment is from Rachel Binkley. Director Binkley, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Oh, looks like she put her hand down, so maybe not. No, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you, I Director I just wanted Binkley. to make sure I got that hand down before you called on me twice. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, Thank you. No worries. I had I had a similar question to the previous director, um, but it was kind of more around contingency. Um, if the data really changes permanently, like the amount of people working from home that might not need to live near transportation um, or things like that. I mean, it just sounds like we might come out of this just with a completely different um way of life that could be permanent in some ways uh are you guys looking at that information yeah i think uh the one that that might be most relevant if we're talking about working from home those kind of things is uh this non-single occupant vehicle travel this is actually measuring uh work commute trips um so this is something we'd be keeping our eye on um as new data comes out about especially about teleworking um, and that is something that I know that some of my colleagues at Dr. Cog, especially in our Way to Go program, are looking at uh, with some surveys they have out now. So not waiting for this administrative data that we rely on here. Um, but that is something that through plan amendment processes, if we look at some of these things and we realize that our target may just not be ambitious enough with some of these things that are changing, it's something that um, the, this plan is designed to be dynamic and responsive. And it is something that can be amended. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Director Binkley. And thank you, Andy. And with that, uh, I do not see any other hands raised. Thank you so much, Ms. Stevens. Mr. Taylor, please continue. Uh, yes, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the initiative piece of this, of all the work that's happening, both locally and not even uh, that, but also at the regional level. Um, thinking about measures is just part of the story. Um, and uh, you heard all about one of these uh, tonight, about Regional Vision Zero, uh, but there's so many, I probably couldn't fit um, much more on, on this screen, but I just want you to, to know that there's, uh, setting the measure and talking about the target are, are just part of the story. It's really where we can take action and try and see how those move the needle. Um, at, the, at the chair's discretion, again, I'd entertain any feedback that you'd like to offer about these measures. Um, we're here to listen. Um, really, uh, what, what I'm curious about and what others that are listening on the line from my team are listening uh, to is, does this spark any questions or curiosity that staff could further investigate? Um, you, you've seen through uh, Vision Zero, just the number of analyses that could be behind just a single number here uh, related to, to uh, one of these Metro Vision measures, that there's many more analyses we could do to, to dig in a little bit more um, and try and find out what's going on. Um, but also, are there any items here that may warrant more focused discussion that could be brought back in a, a setting that's uh, uh, better for uh, discussing these, these types of issues and identifying uh, potential initiatives um, uh, that are worth discussing, uh, just seeing where we may be uh, behind schedule on some of these measures? Uh, thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, directors, uh, 
Does any of this uh, inspire you? Uh, please, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, Ms. Stevens will call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Give everyone just a moment to get hands raised in case there are any questions or comments. Okay, I am seeing none at this time. All right, uh, Mr. Taylor, you, you have us at a loss. We're, we're overwhelmed. Um, thank you so well, much. Well, if you think of anything, please reach out um, um, to, to myself or Brad Calvert. Um, we're always willing to listen to some potential research questions and see how we can work that into our work. Thank you. Is that all, Mr. Taylor? Yes, that Thank is it. Just, thank you so much for your presentation. Truly really appreciate it. The, uh, the next item um, is item 11, proposed technical amendments to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Manager of Long Range Transportation Planning here at Dr. Cog. Um, this is just a really brief item, really just a transparency item that we just wanted to bring to your attention. Um, as you've heard tonight, we're in the midst of creating our, developing our 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So we weren't planning on any additional amendments to our adopted 2040 uh, Regional Transportation Plan. However, in the course of some routine uh, stakeholder coordination with the E-470 Public Highway Authority, it did come to our attention that one of their projects uh, is going to open sooner. Uh, than was originally anticipated. Um, that's good news. Um, that project is in our plan already, in our 2040 plan. It's the main line widening of E-470 from 46 lanes uh, from Quincy Avenue up to I-70. So as I said, that project is already in our existing 2040 uh, adopted plan. Um, however, it's kind of staged later in the plan in terms of when we thought it would open. <clears throat> so to meet federal requirements, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to meet federal requirements, we simply just need to change the uh, kind of what we call the air quality staging period of that project. Uh, nothing else about the plan or the project, uh, any other parameters are changing, but uh, we just need to make that one very minor technical change. Um, but because it does relate to air quality conformity requirements, we do need to follow our planning uh, process on this. So we actually are in a 30-day public comment period uh, that started earlier this week. Uh, we will have a public hearing uh, in front of uh, all of you at our June board meeting. Uh, so we're following our typical process, but we wanted to give you uh, a heads up just that this is out there. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. Directors, are there any questions for uh, for Jacob at this time? Ms. Stevens, please uh, let me know if there are any hands. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will give everyone just a brief moment to get those hands raised. Okay, and at this time, I am seeing none. Great. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, the next item, committee reports. Uh, the first committee report is the report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Jones. Thank you, Director Dyack. Um, so this is from the SPAC meeting uh, last Friday. Um, we received an update on the 2045 state, statewide plan process. CDOT's going to propose a 60-day public re review period um, stretching from June 1 to July 30th, which is double the typical 30-day public comment that they normally give, and doing that because of the extraordinary circumstances we're under. And the plan is for stack to review and hopefully uh, recommend approval to the Transportation Commission of that plan in August. Uh, the stack voted unanimously to affirm the 10-year strategic pipeline of projects list. Um, CDOT wants to use this quote as their North Star document. So as funding becomes available, they'll just pull projects off that list. And then the biggest part of the meeting, as you might have guessed, is uh, looking at the state budget and how it's supposed to um, impact projects, transportation projects. CDOT's anticipating revenue reductions and cost reductions from the general fund of more than 250 million over the next couple of fiscal years. And also that years three and four of the Senate Bill 267 funds are not likely to happen. So this is gonna cause a disproportionate impact on the metro region as well as some other areas. So um, CDOT's looking at that and um, it, the plan for the second tranche of uh, Senate Bill 267 funds is to, there's about $125 million left after um, they pay out for projects that are already committed. 
and they would they proposed that we spend 50 million of that for the I-25 North segments seven and eight, and then focus the rest on restoring regional equity, which means increasing um, funds available to regions one, two, and three, which are below the equity targets. So that translates into $21 million to region one for the urban arterial safety improvement program. So there was support for that. So that was positive for our region. So I'll stop there. Those were the meeting highlights. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, the next report out is a report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Metro Mayors has continued weekly meetings since back in March in regards to the COVID impacts that we are all seeing. Those meetings will continue until such time as we don't need them anymore. We have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with the governor. Uh, he will be talking, we believe, about what his plans are for next week as far as opening up more businesses within the state. Also, Mayor Hancock and CDPHE will be holding a press conference on Friday on the city and county of Denver and what their plans are for reopening. At this point, we are continuing to monitor the, uh, the health of our communities and uh, working as much as we can with the state, CDPHE, and our local health departments to keep as many businesses open as possible. That's our report, sir. Thank you, Director Axison. The next report out is the report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and we did not have a meeting, so there's no report. Thank you very much, Director Partridge. Uh, the next report out is a report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, Ms. Sanchez-Warren. Executive yes. Director Rex, is, uh, yes. is Ms. Sanchez-Warren available? Well, she she's supposed to be. She's on the call. I'm, maybe she's having technical issues. I, I will just I'll tell you the advisory committee on aging met last Friday, uh, or yeah, last Friday, and um, basically the the items that they discussed were the ones that were presented in the finance and budget committee that, um, this evening and was reported out by myself. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, uh, Executive Director Rex. Do you want to roll into the Regional Air Quality Council? Report. Yes, thank you very much. Um, RAC met on May 1st. Uh, we had an update on the series area ozone SIP development. Uh, we talked primarily about the reasonably available control technology or RACT. Um, we got a little status updates. It's the beginning of the ozone season. So we just talked about some of the trends associated with what we're expecting this coming year and what we are crossing our fingers for is a, is a, is a good ozone year, of course. Um, we had a couple informational briefings, one from Excel Energy, um, talking about their EV or electric vehicle supply infrastructure program. And we got a, a presentation from Scott Landis from the Air Pollution Control Division about the impacts of air quality from COVID-19, which was pretty interesting. It might even be something worthwhile to line up for the board. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next report out is the report from the E-470 Authority. Director Teal, are you... Are you there? Why, well, yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. How's my audio? I know you could tell distinctly with all those votes that how I came across as an I. <laughs> I'll take it that my audio is coming across okay. It, it uh, is. It is, Director Teal. We can hear you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, hey, everybody. Uh, George Teal from Castle Rock here. Uh, the 470 board met on May 14th. Um, the report from the finance department really dominated the meeting. Um, several items were um, were covered during the finance report, but it, it really focused around uh, the efforts that were planned for this summer to uh, refinance about $250 million of debt uh, for the uh, authority. Um, the good news is uh, that schedule does look to be um, in place, it does look that we will be able to uh, refinance about $250 million of debt for the authority this summer. Um, additional information though is the impact on COVID-19 on the uh, authority's finances. I'm sure we can all imagine a lot of the use of the E-470 tollway comes from people commuting to and from work. It come, probably comes as no surprise 
that the traffic on E-470 has dropped uh, measurably uh, since COVID-19. The stay-at-home orders uh, have been in effect. Um, the good news is that does not seem to be, um, well, around the country, there are other toll authorities that are affected greatly by this situation. E-470 is not the only one. Uh, however, it does appear that the finances of E-470, due to prior planning by prior boards over the course of the last decade, has put it on a very sound financial footing. And so we do believe we're going to be able to refinance. Um, one casualty of the COVID crisis has been the planned uh, uh, reduction in toll rates. At this stage of the game, at this stage of the year, uh, the board did not feel confident that uh, those toll cuts could go through and uh, are reserving um, the, the opportunity to look at those later in the year after the refinance it goes through. Um, that was really the big stuff being discussed this month. Of course, Chairman, I defer to you, given your key role played on the Finance Committee uh, for the E-470 board to add in ad any additional color facts or figures. Uh, thank you, Director Teal. Uh, I, I guess in terms of traffic uh, dislocation from peak to trough this year, uh, it bottomed out at a 70% uh, reduction in traffic. Uh, in terms of the bond refinancing, uh, we're potentially going to save uh, 200 basis points or 2%, which uh, will, will equate to a pretty significant uh, rate of return uh, for, for the authority. It's going to put on level debt, and uh, the board is fully committed. To, uh, to reducing tolls. Uh, we just needed to get through this uh, structural bond refinancing first uh, before we readdress tolls. Generally, we, we address tolls in uh, September to October, uh, but due to the bond refinancing, uh, we had to accelerate that process. And just because of the events, we, there was no possible way that we could consider a toll rate cut and uh, refinance bonds going into a market where all of the, the tolling authorities were on negative, put on negative watch. So um, that sort of concludes the, I guess, colors as Mr. Teal put it. Uh, the next report out is a report from CDOT. Uh, Ms. White. Sure, good. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Director Jones noted, uh, a lot of our, the focus of our organization as, as with many of you has been on uh, the um, budget impacts we're expecting due to COVID-19. Um, Director Jones sort of outlined those um, very well. Uh, it is, you know, doesn't look like very good news when we uh, look to the future of um, the impact we're seeing on gas tax revenue, managed lane revenue, and then anticipated dollars from the general fund. So we are, are doing a lot of work with our Transportation Commission. Uh, tomorrow is our fourth meeting in, in just the last month to walk them through various uh, scenarios. And really the, the theme of, of what we're trying to achieve is we need to, to assume the worst and be prepared for that, but, but also at the same time plan for the best. Um, so we are um, adding back in and, and prioritizing projects as we know more about um, our future financing. And, and to that end, we're very hopeful um, and um, should know quite soon with certainty that the second year of Senate Bill 267 uh, will be issued, which is phenomenal. That's the, the second of four years of that potential revenue. And so the commission will be taking a look at, at the full range of projects that they want to move forward with that tranche. And then we will um, move, we'll take it from there and um, see uh, what more we learn from this uh, financial impact and how we can best get dollars into the economy and, and keep moving forward. Um, but on a more positive note, one of the, the projects we are moving forward with the commission and hope to have a positive outcome tomorrow is our partnership with the Pog on the urban arterials. Uh, that's it, coming up a couple different places with the commission tomorrow and, and hopefully we have a good outcome and, and can uh, move forward with you all to hopefully make a really big difference in the safety in our metro area. That's it for me. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the next report out, uh, report on fast tracks, Mr. Van Meter. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is Bill Van Meter. Two updates. 
One is to let everyone know that the RTD board has formally moved forward with the solicitation for a permanent general manager and chief executive officer for RTD. So that advertisement was made, I believe, formally earlier just this week, a couple of days ago. And it closes, I know, at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on July 10th, 2020. So the process um, to find a permanent general manager and chief executive officer is underway under the direction of the RTD board. And uh, the other item that I wanted to just provide a real brief update, I touched upon it last month, but is RTD's budget scenarios um, given the fallout from the COVID-19 impacts and our budget scenarios were reviewed with our board of directors and updated set of scenarios just Tuesday night by our CFO Heather McKillop and they're projecting in a um, in a mid case scenario for just 2020 a 255 million dollar drop in revenues for our TD um, the CARES Act funding that many of you are aware of is about $232 million. So there's a negative hold to um, climb out of for 2020 for RTD, not to mention a very poor position starting into 2021. So the Board of Directors has been discussing a number uh, with staff, a number of budget cutting measures um, it, for near and um, longer term at RTD, and that's a key focus at RTD at the moment. The next fast tracks, um, well, planning capital programs and fast tracks committee meeting of the RTD board is scheduled for June 2nd. So I'll have more information um, specifically pertaining to fast tracks based on the results of that scheduled committee meeting there was none this month and that chair and members completes my update thank you thank you director van meter appreciate it the next uh, section of the agenda informational items they are in your packet items 13 14 and 15 uh please feel free again read them at your leisure there will be a quiz next month uh, next uh, administrative items item 16 the next meeting is june 17th 2020 are there any other matters by members? Ms. Stevens, are there any hands? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm waiting just a moment to see if any hands go up. Okay, and it looks like at this time, oh, we have one. It looks like Director Jones, you have something you'd like to say? Oh, I just had a question. Will there be a work session on the first week of June? If our next meeting is June 17th, is that just the next board meeting or is that the next Dr. Cog member related meeting? Executive Director Rex, would you like to address that? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Jones, um, we're not anticipating one at this time, although we reserve the right <laughs> to, to have one. Um, the June 17th date does refer to the next uh, business business board meeting, um, but we're not anticipating having having a work session at this point. Thank you, almost. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. So, Doug, it's a solid probably not. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you. Um, any other matters by members? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Melinda. Um, at this time, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Um, and at 835, I would adjourn our meeting. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.